Yes, I'm sorry. I am here. I had to unmute. It took me a second. All right. So shall we uh, shall we start talking about these lectures? Yes. Uh, it's seven o'clock, but uh, we'll. I'm sure we'll have a couple more people jumping in. Um, anyway, I just wanted to first tell you guys that I had a personal. Uh, I'm not sure if I'd call it a tragedy, but um, one of my oldest friends uh, died uh, today. Uh, he's a guy that I uh, first got together with as a friend back in second grade. Uh, oh my goodness. Turns out in second grade, we had a couple of friends, uh, four of us all started hanging out together. And uh, we remained friends uh, until now. And uh, this friend of mine uh, had Parkinson's. Mm which he developed about 15 years ago. Um, and he did a lot of, he was a magazine editor, did a lot of improvisational comedy also. So he was known and loved by a lot of people that did the improv, that he keep taught improv to. And uh, about two weeks ago, he had a kind of heat stroke, partly due to Parkinson's. And uh, he was brought into the ER with a temperature of 110. Um, anyway, they intubated him, they brought him back, he had, and then he had a heart attack. Um, so, you know, I'm just kind of in a reflective mood about uh, my friend Tom. And yeah. uh, because, you know, in the path work, of course, death is not really a tragedy, right? I mean, death is, is a transition. And as the guide says, you know, life and death kind of, well, it's a, it's a false duality, right? I mean, not to say that you can't miss somebody who dies, yeah. And I was kind of thinking about my friend Tom and, you know, how he coped with his challenges in life. And uh, he was extremely uh, focused on the improv and videotape editing and writing. And he was a very, very busy man, always kept himself busy. And um, um, I was thinking about ways in which people avoid suffering. Um, one of those ways being being preoccupied with something with another person or with a job or with something they're enthusiastic about and maybe blind themselves to their own inner journey and sometimes i think if you can feel your suffering you can hear it then you can start right transcending it making steps to feeling better but if you don't allow yourself to heal it, to hear it rather, to feel it, then you're kind of trapped in other things, you know, busy work, for lack of a better word. And um, so I was thinking that when people experience um, absorption in something valuable like art, or literature or music, they forget their pain and they forget their sorrow. And after reading these lectures, I was kind of wondering and thinking that maybe asking for the hand of Jesus Christ is also a way to uh, transcend your own sorrow, your own pain. So I was kind of thinking about that. That's what my my friend's death kind of made me reflect on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, oh, there's a bunch of folks coming in. So are you feeling sad? Talk about feeling, Ellen. Are you feeling sad? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Darlene. Hi, Tarya. Sorry I didn't let you guys in. I was distracted. Um, I was just talking to everybody about the death of my my oldest friend today that we were pals in second grade and he died today he had parkinson's disease and he had a heat stroke um and i was sort of thank you i was reflecting on on his life and on whether people get preoccupied with tasks and projects to distract themselves from feeling uh their own sorrow um because my friend was extremely busy to the point of, I think, neglecting how he really felt about a lot of things. Um, and I was wondering if the hand of Jesus Christ is something that we can hold to transcend our own sorrow, to allow us to take the pathwork journey. 
So um, these two lectures, I mean, I felt like they were kind of one and they were close. And, uh, you know, when you read the final Pathwork lecture, you kind of think that you should have, there should be a feeling of finality about it. You know, that the guide would say, okay, this has been a great, you know, we've had a lot of great, great lectures and, you know, go forth and be of good cheer. But it doesn't end like that. It, it ends just like any lecture. And, uh, you know, if you've read Finnegan's Wake, how the book really begins and ends in the same place, it doesn't end. I kind of had the same feeling about these lectures that like one kind of blends into the other there. There is no last Pathwork lecture. They all kind of circle around, you know, and cycle around together. So I have a couple of things I wanted to talk about, about the lecture. Um, in the lecture about Jesus Christ, on page five, he says, and this is kind of the path for process, he says, visualize yourself taking a firm stand against all thoughts that are negative and divisive in any way. Seriously question any thoughts that seem correct, but fail to give you a feeling of peace, love and unity that make you feel disharmonious and in any way uncomfortable. Just being willing to let in that light of truth, the truth of God, rather than your temporary perception of truth will create a shift in your consciousness. So that I think in a nutshell is our, our job here in the Pathwork process, which is not to hide our perception of thoughts which are negative or divisive, to question them, to allow them into our consciousness, to question them. So, and of course this lecture emphasizes the fact that the personal knowledge of the help and assistance provided by Jesus Christ is critical in overcoming what the guide calls our guilt. That's kind of interesting. There's a lot of discussion about guilt in this lecture. And um, that bears some, some meditation. The idea being that we feel erroneous guilt for our lower selves for our negative, our negativity. And another important point, he says on the first page, you can experience only that which you can conceive of and believe in. So obviously it's very difficult to believe in the love of Jesus Christ if you can't really conceive of it. If you, if you don't feel this is a valid concept you know, that Jesus Christ can personally care for you, then you can't experience it. And I think that that's something that, that really is, is something that's necessary to, to meditate about. Just to recap what he says about guilt for, uh, for just a little bit. He says on page one, it is true that without at least a slight awareness that you are personally precious and beloved to the, to the personified God, Jesus Christ, it is extremely difficult to accept your guilt and to find your real value. Then again on page five, he says, if you feel personally humiliated by being wrong, by being imperfect, by having made a mistake, it will be much more difficult for you to let go of the tight hold of your position. The reason is that you secretly hold a low opinion of yourself. The lower this opinion is, the greater must be your stake in some prideful, egotistical, self-elevating and self-righteous position that at the same time creates projected judgments of others. And uh, finally,
on uh, page eight. How could you ever overcome the hurdle of your self-hate that festers underneath all your defenses if it were not for the experience of Christ's personal love, forgiveness, acceptance, and total vision of you? How could you learn to love yourself without at least knowing and finally experiencing his love for you? So I think that what the guide is saying is that we have to be prepared to accept um, low opinion of ourselves, self-hate, the negativity allowed to come to the surface. And um, all of this, of course, leads to the idea that when you are able to go through that purification process, then you can make good decisions. And the last thing I wanted to say is in this last lecture, the guide puts forward, I think one of the central key paradoxes of, a, of this pathwork, which is a, probably the paradox of a lot of spiritual paths, that there are three things that have to happen at the same time that seem contradictory or paradoxical. Number one, only, only us can, can save ourselves. We have to do it. And this is why, of course, a lot of people have an issue with the phrase, Christ died for your sins. I mean, the guide, of course, explains that Christ made it possible for beings to come back to God. But that's not the same thing. People say, Christ died for your sins. That seems to imply that you get a free pass, you know, that you can just repent of your sins and everything is fine. But the guide, of course, talks about the importance of our personal work and another thing that's critical in the path work is many incarnations you know in both these lectures the guide says that there are many and many 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 lives so it's kind of a bigger picture than most of us are prepared to think about and that a lot of people don't really take seriously i mean this whole idea that you know you can come back through many many lives to work on one small aspect. So interesting, right? Anyway, so the second point, the first point being you have to do it yourself. No one's gonna take the burden off of you. You have to do the work yourself. The second point, you can't do it alone. You need the help of others who share the journey. We need the help of each other. We need the help of a pathwork helper or another leader, somebody in our lives that's inspirational. And then the third point is, without God, with, without the personal assistance of the personal aspect of God, the undertaking is too vast for you to accomplish. So here I think is the central importance of asking for help. And that is, of course, what the ego doesn't want to do. So my friends, I really think that I need some help experiencing the personal love of Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to feign feeling his love, but I do want to let it into my heart. Um, so I just want to say that to you guys, because I feel like it's very difficult to do it alone, right? Without relying on something greater. And you know, the guide says it's, it is the personal love personal assistance of Jesus that makes such a huge difference. So let me open it up to discussion, everyone. And uh, what are your thoughts? Tracy, why did you? Uh, oh, go ahead, Stephen. What's on your mind? I have a, a question, actually. You know, for, it seems to me for me to be able to experience, let's say, the love of Jesus, would I not have to first experience the love within myself? How can I experience somebody else's love without experiencing my own love for myself? Uh, I don't know. Um, it's, it's a question. I'm not sure I can actually experience that love without first understanding my own self-love. Well, I think that you have to ask yourself the different levels 
like the higher self, lower self and mask, right? I mean, when you talk about, there's egotism. Now that's not to be confused with, with self-love, right? I guess the ego builds a false image, right? The idealized self-image of perfection. That's certainly not what we're talking about when we talk about self-love. And I think that what's difficult, you know, is to accept the bullshit, to accept the ugliness, to accept the pettiness uh, that all of us have. That, that's, that's difficult. Like if I identify my lower self as being lazy, not wanting to work out, not wanting to keep, keep my body in good shape so that I can, you know, not feel good and I can not accomplish my goals. What's there to like about an attitude like that? Um, or jealousy or wanting to get something I'm not entitled to. That's certainly, uh, there's not much that's lovable about that. You know, but then again, we always have the very positive words of the guide about our divine nature and how wonderful it is and how beautiful the, our divine aspects are. But somehow I think that the, this lecture is saying that you need more than that. You need to know. He's saying here that you need to know that Jesus Christ personally cares about you, which is kind of interesting. It's hard to believe. I mean, for me anyway, maybe that's just because I'm egotistical and maybe that's just because I want to take his place or something like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you can't do it alone. Does that, does that help? Illuminating okay. the it, well, the while you were speaking, the thought occurred to me, you know, my lower self, if I reject it, aren't I rejecting parts of myself? When I have to incorporate the lower self into who I am uh, and, I, and open up to it as well, because probably the lower self has something to teach me as well, as well as the higher self. Yes. Be able to embrace it rather than reject it. I think yeah. in two, yeah, that the lower self points out where you need to work. And also the lower self, the energy it carries can be transformed right into the positive direction if you understand what the positive aspect of the lower self current is. And then you kind of flip it and transform it. Can I, can I th 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 uh, jump in? Of course, here? Joel. So uh, just briefly, yeah, I, I, think, I think that um, the lower self is actually our friend, right? So, so if we're all the universe, right? And every, every quality in the universe is represented within us. And so how do we, um, like you were saying, Ellen, how do, how do we transform the lower self? So, so it's it's not by rejecting the lower self or judging the lower self. It's by by befriending the lower self, right? So, so if we go into our lower selves and we we act out, we behave in a way that we we are uncomfortable with afterwards, right? Let's say we're self righteous and we yell at somebody, and then afterwards we say, "Oh my God, you know what was really you know going on there? Oh well, somebody had I was upset about something else." So the lower self is pointing me towards the the parts of myself that I need to bring into the light, right? They're 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 affording me this opportunity. So that's that's how I try to think about that, um, and that that's very that's been very helpful for me. But I wanted to go back to what Stephen's question about love, and so I think that you know love. <laughs> is such a personal has such a personal definition for each of us right and um, i think it's it's helpful for me when i think about what are the qualities of, of love right so it's that um your, your your friend is upset and you you put your arm around him with your words and your kindness and your concern or maybe you just listen right you're just present and and so that's that's love, right? Um, or um, that you you see that uh, uh, Marion talks about seeing the beauty around us and just pausing for twenty seconds and taking that beauty in. Well, that's 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 self love, right? That's connecting with the higher self. And so I think that these. I guess the question. 
maybe it's the, the answer to the question, Stephen, is to say, well, what is love for you? And how have you experienced it? How have you expressed it? <clears throat> for me, if I just simply put my, put my hand on my chest, on my heart, um, I find that's very comforting. And, and I feel that. Um, and, and that to me, that sensation that I feel, the warmth, um, puts me in touch with what I think of as love. And then, you know, the guide part of it is that we, we have a trust. The guide knows more than we do, right? He's, he's like a big brother. He's our, he's our friend, our, our, um, our teacher, our mentor. And so some things I just take at face value. And then, so, so I say, okay, God, God loves me, right? And well, I, how do I see that, right? Maybe it's in the kindness of a, of a stranger or, um, you, you know, whatever. You, you, you just experience some, some uh, unexpected uh, good experience, right? Is, is that the love of God? Um, so, it, so it's kind of just taking certain principles, things that are said in the guide, God loves you, God sees you, God knows you, God answers your prayers, God hears you, and just say, okay, I'm not, I don't really know if I believe that, I don't know that I really experience that, but let me trust in the guide and see if that begins to manifest in my life. You know, maybe you say, please show me your presence in my life. I'm having a hard time feeling that. The guide also says that love is an act of will. Uh, so when you look at yourself and you say, I determine to let myself experience whatever I'm experiencing, that's an act of, of love. When you yes. make a decision, right? Yes. And you know, I don't know, does the guide ever say that God loves you? I mean, the guide says that Jesus Christ loves you personally, right? I mean, I guess he does. Well, so let's go back to the definition in the guide, the explanation of what, of who is Jesus, right? And so my understanding is that if the, if love, if the infinite consciousness is an ocean, that some of that ocean is, takes form in a human being and that God in his infinite love and mercy sends this messenger to help lift us up and guide us to find the God within that is inimical to our, to our very being, right? But we've gotten lost. When you say messenger, do you mean Jesus Christ or do you mean the divine spark? I, I meant Jesus. So, so, so that's my understanding is that Jesus became incarnate as a human being, but he had all of the qualities of the ocean and that he did that for us to, to help us. Well, the guide says that Jesus Christ has the greatest amount of the divine substance next to God. And the guide says that we all share this divine substance. That's a, that's an early Christian heresy. Christian doctrine is that we're dust and we do not partake in the divine um, substance of God, but the pathwork says we do. And the pathwork says that we, that Jesus Christ waged a battle with temptation. Yes. And, and waged a battle so that the satanic forces would have to release us from bondage and allow us to exercise free will. Yeah, I love that lecture. Yeah, and I think that, sorry, go ahead. The Course says that um, very much what we're talking about, about Jesus Christ, that um, he, what he did, what he chose to do, I don't mean the crucifixion, I mean coming in and what he did, who he was, incarnate. He, he made a bridge from us to God. Because You're talking about he, the Course in Miracles, right? Miracles, yes, yes. yes. That 
if we were on our own or we, we were not, did not have the strength that Jesus Christ as a human being when he came in had, we would never be able to get back to God. One human, I say it this way, one human being had to have the strength or the courage or whatever it took to make that bridge between us and God. That's what now, the guide says. Yeah. Oh, does he? Okay, because I yeah. may not, I'm coming it's from like, It's just the same thing, yes. But, you know, Buddha may have been a part of that. You know, you can't just say, because the Course says Jesus was the first, the first human, that's my word, but he's indicating, the first human to make that transition for us so that we would have one step to lean on to get to God. But it, the first doesn't mean a chronological, you know. So uh, it's very possible that whatever, however it takes place in the, in, in spiritual terms, that Buddha may have been a part of it and, and then Jesus, Buddha may have been Jesus, and then Jesus finally got to the place where he could do what, what he needed to do for us. Anyone else who hasn't said anything? Any thoughts? Well, this is Marion. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, something I, re I remember, please, there's some things I'm just going to be paraphrasing. There's some going to come from my memory, so I'm not to be quoted. All right? However, I remember the guide saying in some of the transmissions that the pathwork is not perfect. The message is in there, yes. It is also influenced by the instrument. So we have to make everything true within ourselves, and that's what I really totally honor in this, these meetings we have, is making true for ourselves. So I can come from a place of knowing, and if I'm coming from a place of knowing, how does anybody else know to trust me if, if they don't, are at the same, you know, the same, on the same page? And other things may be belief, which is only belief, and some things may be conviction because I trust the teacher who conveyed it to me. Uh, so there's levels and layers of knowing. And from my knowingness, and I will share that from a place of sharing, not teaching. And that is, even in the name of Jesus Christ, that was not Jesus' name. He was Jesus of Nazareth. And Christ is the name of the station in the, ma in the hierarchy. Like Buddha was not, not his name. It was Siddhartha Gautama. Buddha is the name of the station in the spiritual hierarchy, the highest of the high. So I won't go any further with that because that's, I mean, people know from in the group, my master is Mayor Baba, except as the Christ of the age. So I'm not going to go into that. Um, how, so however, these, how we use these words and looking at the guide, Jesus Christ, and at times the guide says, Christ, the Christ, and doesn't put Jesus before it. These kind of nuances are very important because even though these lectures are not perfect, the truth filtering is, is. So I make those distinctions, and that's why you know these groups are you know we're having and sharing is so valuable. So that's all I have to say about that, um, you know, from my perspective. All right. And you you don't you don't return without the hand of God. In fact, the Pathwork Guide said this. You know, when you're dissolving an image, you cannot do it without. And he used as a metaphor somewhere in some lecture without the hand of God. That's a metaphor. Teresa, what are your Thank thoughts? You. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. Darlene. Hi, Ellen. Thank you for asking. Uh, hi, Teresa. <clears throat> How are you? Um, well, it's just a very beautiful, powerful lecture. And I think that, you know, from my perspective, um, I think the God and the Jesus and everybody else, it's absolutely necessary, and I agree with everything. But you can also internalize this energy, you know, by like meditating and praying, um, something in you wakes up, you know, your higher self. And by aligning that part of yourself 
with Jesus or Buddha or anybody else for that matter and um, allowing that higher knowing and intuition um, you know that um, that also sheds a lot of light um, <clears throat> on the whole struggle because yes we have we have the lower self it's hard to accept it and it can be obnoxious and stuff but by feeling it and then going in and maybe by meditation or prayer or really seeking the help, um, I think it strengthens that part of us and that connection. And then so at some point, you know, we kind of sort of like um, strengthen ourselves to the point that we feel lovable. We feel what? Lovable? Yeah. We start feeling lovable. You start feeling like, yeah, you know, it's, and I also feel, um, it has a lot to do with the upbringing because if you were um, brought up by parents who were very strict and the vision of God, like in Europe, when I was brought up, was very old fashioned, God that punishes, you know, and watches you, then it's very hard to believe in uh, Jesus being pure love and God being pure love. So I think experiencing that even from another human being or from anywhere, experiencing unconditional love, in any form, also strengthens that notion that yes, I'm lovable. You know, there's something about me that's absolutely lovable, despite this lower self, despite this. And also I feel loving somebody else with that kind of unconditional love, with uh, some kind of a soulful love that, you know, in soul connection, you also see the fault of the other person. You also see that they're not perfect, just like you, but you still love them. So that also enhances that notion that, yeah, you know, um, he's lovable or she's lovable, even though they're not perfect. So therefore, I am lovable, even though I am not perfect. So I think that, first of all, experiencing unconditional love from anybody strengthens the notion that God is love and God can love me despite, you know, whatever other crap uh, was put on it. And then strengthening that internal bond with yourself any way you can, through loving yourself, through caring for yourself, um, talking lovingly to yourself, being good to yourself, meditating, somehow appreciating yourself for the good that you are and, and can be, and even for the bad, uh, puts this notion in place that, yeah, God can love me because, you know what, I can love me and somebody else can love me and I can love somebody who's not perfect. So to me, that was the journey, you know, coming from this old-fashioned punishing God who just watches to, you know, to, to give it to you because you did something wrong and guilt-ridden to saying, well, wait a minute, uh, people can love me despite mm -hmm. my faults and my fears and I can love me despite them. And the more I engage with this thing, the more lovable I feel. So God must see all of these parts of me and he must see that at the end, I am very lovable. Do you so feel, I think, you know. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, do you feel the love of God in your life, Teresa? I do. And I, I, I actually pray to God and I feel synchronicities. And I also feel the cruelty and uh, harshness comes from me. And from that fear that I haven't had a chance to read all these lectures, but the, the one that you open with, that we have this negative thinking and we generate this fear and opposing those thoughts, I think it's, it's a tremendous test because they lie. They are a lie. And they just, you know, I create them all the time. Like I have a meeting with my boss and I'm like, oh, he's probably gonna punish me in some way. He's gonna fire me. And I'm like, that's just fear. We don't have any proof of that. And then the meeting goes great. You know, and so what was that thought? It's a self-punishing thought, maybe because my parents were harsh or some, some authority figure. So that first thing you read really struck home for me 100% that watch those thoughts, examine those thoughts, ask if they're really true, and go deep in there because they have to be stopped in order for you to really allow that self-love and the love of God and to notice it. Because we create the reality. God gave us the power of creation, but if we create with those fearful thoughts, it's us. It's not God. It's us. It's on us. 
what is what do people think of thank you very much any thoughts about the difference between the love from god and the love from jesus christ does anyone feel uh, that those two things are different i don't know how they could be alan because well my understanding is that when god created jesus christ and us as one he he emptied all of himself or he gave everything except the, the ultimate that he is god because he is the creator but we have everything that god has so i and so jesus christ does too so i don't th from my point of view jesus christ and god are one as i am one with god of course god is the creator that goes without doubt. Arya, what do you think? Do you have any thoughts about this subject? Oh, I thought I was muted. Okay. Um, I haven't re actually really thought about it. I had pretty much thought that God and Jesus Christ are the same and one person. So it's kind of like a new to me that they are not. I haven't really read about that too much. So, um, of course, I, I learned in school about Jesus Christ, but uh, I somehow thought that they would be just one, one thing altogether. And now I'm learning that it's not exactly like that. My experience of... Um God and Jesus is that they express very differently. Um, it's almost like Jesus is more like a human being and can talk to you face to face. And God is a lot more abstract or I don't know what the word is. Not personal in the same way. Yeah, and not necessarily linguistically the same way, if that makes sense. Like, he doesn't necessarily speak in words the way Jesus might seem to, to you. Like, that's just my experience, though, like, of having meditated and met both entities. You know, the other thing another important section of this lecture, positive aggression. I mean, I think that Jesus Christ model, models positive aggression in the Gospels. I mean, there's the famous scene where he throws over the tables of the moneylenders, right? Now that's an aggressive act, uh, even a violent act, but it was done to basically assert something very positive, which is that you know, the buying and selling of things or money doesn't have any place in the temple basically was a aggressive renunciation of materialism. Um, so the whole, the, this lecture, it's interesting, this last lecture here really becomes a appeal to us to use our positive aggression. I mean, Darlene, in your experience, does when you feel the presence of Christ, does it impel you or does he call you to be positively aggressive in your life? Um, actually, what happened for me when I met him, I had a visceral reaction to him. I was very angry at him, which was surprised me. <laughs> so I don't know how to answer your question because my experience um, wasn't like that. And like I, my experience with God is much more um, friendly, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Like it's like I trust Him, and for some reason I have a hard time trusting Jesus. And well, He told me it's because I need to get to know Him instead of what they said He was in my background, in my Christian Christian background. Sure. So I have a lot to work out with Him, and I. You know, I appreciate this lecture because it gave me opportunity to spend some more time with him and kind of follow up on his kind of 
admonition to me. <laughs> but I see the positive aggression as him continuing to initiate relationship with me. Because when I was in meditation and he came to me, I had not gone to him. He came to me. Does that make sense? Sure. Mm -hmm. So that's an aspect of positive aggression that I see is that um, constant initiation of relationship. Um, you know, in the Gospels, Christ is always kind of out there, in the beginning anyway, in the first, uh, in the first, the Gospels cover a period of, I don't know, was it three years that Christ preached and teached? Is that right? And, you know, my impression about it is that Christ is actively doing things. He's out there, he's preaching, he's finding disciples, he's working miracles, he's raising Lazarus, he's giving parables, but then when he goes into Jerusalem before the crucifixion, then he's not aggressive in the same way. He then accepts everything that happens and mirrors, tells people that you're doing this, you know, and you've got to take responsibility. So just a thought, but you know, I, I guess, I guess I see Christ as aggressive in a positive way. Uh, this is Marion. May I come in? Of course. This lecture, um, I, it made me smile because I had taken years ago, I mean, decades, you know, the I took that your aggression is self needs to be tr transformed and how to do that prayer, invite, you know, Jesus Christ to be your assistance in this endeavor. I kind of shortened it and I made it and I put it on a, on a card to keep next to my bedside so that I could say this, and I have, because I have this master that I accept as the Christ, and a photo on my bed when he was in human form. So when I set this up, and I say this, and I release it, because I'm trained in core energetics, so I, you know, I say, I'm going to let it rip, you know, my aggression. Well, what 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 that does, for, and then I do, I, 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 and I said, and then I set my intention, that I'm, you know, because I may have have somebody in my life that I'm angry with or I want to get out feelings about. However, I state my intention that I'm doing this to release what is already stored within me and that I'm releasing and they're just a vehicle for it. And that uh, this is the intention to allow, I use the word his, even though it's not a him, um, to fill me with his light, love and light, you know, of the Christ. That's why I'm doing it, not to be angry at people. So that is like a very, very, it's been potent for me for many years. I use that. Then I feel, I feel the Christ in me smiling, smiling, and so joy coming through me after that. Because we read the lecture, the defense lecture this last year, and in there, something we did not focus on that is throughout all the lectures, and in the um, one of the lectures that has it highlighted, that when you fall into your defense, that we all have a triad nature. The guide stresses this of thinking, feeling, and creating with a triad nature. And you see this throughout all spiritual literature, thinking, feeling, and creating. The defense lectures that we have, and we have them on you know, reason, will, and emotion, we've got this whole body of lectures about this triad nature. And it's said in the defense lecture, um, when you go into your defense mechanism, you have either chosen the pseudo solution of aggressiveness and or withdrawal from life and or appeasement that robs you of your integrity. Well, that's will, reason, and emotion. And it behooves us to be steeped in that because when I am releasing this from the, you know, the lecture, uh, this one we're, we're, we're studying now, uh, personal contact with Jesus Christ, I know what I'm doing as a dominant, my dominant defense is emotion, submissiveness. The divine aspect is open heartedness. So I need to get out my aggression, but everybody has the triad nature. My dominant one is submission. So this one is perfect for me. So when I get out my aggression and I walk around with my hands on my hips and I let it rip, I feel that inner 
connection with my personal God, my Christ itself. And there is like a delight because my intention is to clear and claim who I am and stand in the light of God and turn that aggression into true self-assertion. So I just want to say that because it's an area that delights me in that lecture because of how I've turned it into a tool. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Beverly, do you have thoughts about uh, this lecture? Beverly might be taking care of a little dog that she's, ah. so she might have stepped away. I just like to say that I found that positive aggression, the terminology, excellent for me. Because I understand aggression. I know it intimately. But I don't know power when we talk about power in spiritually. I really don't feel like that I'm in touch with my own power, which would be a positive use. So I've been thinking since this lesson that positive aggression can be my power. I mean, I'm familiar with, with that. So I'm going to try to work with it. I, don't, I haven't worked with it long enough. I just read the, this week. So I was very glad, though, to hear that terminology, positive aggression, to use it for a positive cause, of course. That's what it says in the lecture. Thanks. Tracy, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts? Sorry, it just takes me a while to unmute this. Um, well, what, I mean, I have so many thoughts. I mean, what, 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 what is it that you want me to comment on? Well, I guess the personal aspect of Jesus Christ, you know, versus the experience of God or the fact that the guide says that, you know, without God, without the personal assistance of the personal aspect of God, the undertaking is too vast for you to accomplish. How do you how do you feel about that? Well, okay, so so I I mean all of that 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 triad makes sense to me because ultimately self realization is a self responsibility, but the reason that we need each other is not just for the help that we all provide to each other as we do in our group, but also because others will reflect back to you the areas in your own self that are still needing some attention. And I believe 258 speaks to this. So everything that we see and experience is a reflection of our own internal state of consciousness at any given point in time. So the, the others become valuable tools in reflecting to us our own areas where we need to take another look. And then the third part of the triad also makes sense to me because we, in our own individual path towards self-realization, enlightenment, we have to rely on our contact with our higher self, which is, to me, our God self, our divine spark, which is the, which is God. It's, so we can't, that's, if we don't, if, well, speaking for myself, if I, if I try to, to do what I've been doing now since I started the path work without reaching into my higher self, I, I won't have a guide because my, my higher self doesn't lead me astray. My ego can lead me astray and usually does one way or the other. But my higher self is like my true north. So if I can, if I stay connected to my presence, my higher self, which is to me, God, my God energy, then I, I, I it's not going to, 
I'm on I'm on the right road. So that that triad just makes perfect sense to me. Um, if that's what you wanted me to com com comment about, if if you're asking me, do I feel the personal a personal presence of Jesus in my life? I w I would have to say no, I don't. I it's it's an but I feel I I feel very strongly love and I believe that's what Jesus is and that's what God is ultimately and I I feel love for people that I love including all of you and for people that also love me so in that sense that becomes personalized that but but a man that lived 2000 years ago no I, I don't ha I don't feel that that personally um well it's you more know, abstract when the guy and this brings me back I think to like the second lecture he says the love for God the longing for God is the driving force in every human being yes right yes so I mean my dear friends the beginning God's love permeates the entire creation it's a living force a beam that meets itself in an eternal round as everything spiritual must move in circular completeness all creatures are in search of this powerful beam of love whether consciously or unconsciously right they i walk. think of love i think love is the highest vibrational frequency that exists and i think it permeates the entire matrix of the universe of which we are a part and we do search for it and we search for it in many different ways and we're drawn to it. Hmm. Well, we all also manifest it together, you know, as Christ famously says, you know, when two or three are gathered in my name, I'm, I'm in your presence, right? Right, because we touch each other's, the higher selves of all of us recognize, the, recognize one, the higher selves that are, it recognize, that energy recognizes itself and it is attracted to itself. Right, right. Um, I just want to add my own feeling that, you know, I, maybe it was Alan, somebody said it, that, you know, I, in thinking about it and experiencing it right now as we speak, I do experience God's love, but, you know, I think I, before tonight, I used to think, well, if I'd experienced God's love, he'd be like a big teddy bear or something and be wrapping his arms around me, but I don't feel that. But the experience of God's love is somewhat of a tangential way. Uh, I'm healthy. I'm comfortable. Uh, I'm in a good place. And isn't that a form of God's love? And if I see that as God's love, then I am experiencing his love. You mean the fact that by dint of your work and your efforts, you're in a good place? Is that what you mean? Uh, I think of the efforts that I've made and um, the accomplishments, that is God's love guiding me throughout my life. I've never seen it as God's love. Of course, for me, God's love would be like, you know, it was maybe a childish kind of thunderstorm and he, his arms wrapped around me. I say, this is great, like Ten Commandments, the movie, as opposed to I've arrived at a fairly old age in good shape. Is that not a reflection of God's love? Well, I certainly think it is. I mean, uh, well, it, right. And for me to be aware that that is a reflection of God's love is a new, is a shift for me to get out of that maybe childlike approach of God's love has to be in a certain form. It's in many forms and some is very subtle. Beverly, what are your thoughts? Have you been mulling over this lecture? Uh, 
I will apologize. I was dog sitting, so she wasn't letting me pay attention. <laughs> so she's gone now. Um, so I'm good. Um, I guess the only thing I, I can say is I don't, um, I don't, I can't make a distinction between God's love and love. I mean, whenever things are good and I feel good, I feel like that's God. It, that God uses circumstances and people to enhance things in my life. And I feel like everything that, that happens is a gift from God. I mean, the guide often says that the difference between somebody who's kind of more developed on the path work and somebody who isn't is that um, the people that are more, you know, they're, 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 they're further along, they can accept frustration. In other words, that it doesn't have to be your way. The guy's always saying, you know, you're not going to, things are not always going to go your way and you have to be prepared for that frustration. Mm. Um, so, but I, I, I sense, of course, from you, Beverly, that it doesn't upset you that much when things don't go your way. I mean, you're prepared to accept uh, things that are not entirely the, what your ego always wants. Oh, there's not a whole lot I can do about it. So I feel like it is what it is and move on to the next thing. Yeah. And be grateful for when things do go my way, whatever that is, my way is. Uh, Alan, could I just throw in one quick uh, sure. comment that sure. occurred to me in hearing everybody's comments is that, um, you know, in, in, um, one of the definitions, I, I, I believe it, it, at least I, where I learned it was in Judaism, um, about God is that we're, God is, well, well, God, we don't even, in Judaism, you don't even say the name God, it's Yahweh in the beginning and the end, because we're not capable of comprehending God. And so that's kind of a, um, a reminder to us of the vastness um, of, of God. And, um, and so it, it occurred to me that when I listen to everybody that we all have our own language and uh, means of, of connecting with love and with God as, as we understand it. And, uh, and it, it also brings to mind that um, how the guide says, you know, we have limitations in our language and that, and that our limitations of, uh, of our language sometimes make it difficult for the guide to explain things to us. And so I think that God speaks to each one of us in our own language and is reaching out to us. It's almost like music, you know, as some people like jazz, some people like um, classical music. And, and so God is playing the music with, with words and concepts and energy to, to reach us and to, to unfold us with love. And I hear that with, with each person's uh, description. Mm. And the guide always mm. talks also in this lecture about the fact that you have to work both ways from the outer knowledge and the inner knowledge. In other words, your own inner personal process is necessary and so is hearing from others and understanding concepts and things like the lectures. Those, both those things have to be operative. Um, Nancy, yeah. do you have, Nancy, what are your thoughts? Well, um... Back before I didn't think much about when I, back in the days when I didn't think much about God. And um, I did notice that I would get messages and I tuned into them and they were very helpful. I can't think of anything specifically, um, but a person would show up in my life who could, who, would give me something that I needed. And um, I felt very, very fortunate and blessed to have this, um, being able to pick up all these messages. I seem to have lost some of that ability recently. And, um, and I learned a great phrase probably from, um, not Marianne Williamson, but the other one. You know, it's good to hear the messages when they're whispers and not shouts. 
to be to really tune in to what's being sent to you before it gets really out of hand. Um, and the other thing is, I went I went on a civil rights tour of the South several years ago, and we were in Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, and uh, and of the every the the preachers all have microphones and they were reciting the Lord's Prayer. And they got to the point where they said, and justice and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And they, one of them jumped up and said, no, they're stalking you. <laughs> they want you. <laughs> and that seems like positive aggression. You know, that they're not just passively, oh yeah, they'll follow me, but they're stalking you to recruit you. Mm. <laughs> I think that's uh, Psalm 100, not the Lord's Prayer. Lord's Prayer, yeah, that's not the Lord's Prayer. I meant the Lord is my shepherd. Yes, the Psalm 23, right. Psalm 23, that's what I meant to say, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's something I treasure. And um, and to me, I do feel Jesus is more accessible. I mean, he had a body. And so much of what I learned is through body contact. And so that makes him more accessible to me than the abstract God. Well, suffering occurs in the body, right? I mean, to a great degree. But so I does mean, pleasure. This is true. I so think, does uh, pleasure. And so does happiness. I mean, there's mental suffering too. And mm -hmm. I think when people talk about suffering, they mainly talk about uh, physical suffering. But of course, you know, it's always said, right, that the greatest suffering that Christ had is when he felt that God had forsaken him. Mm -hmm. That was worse than being crucified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I no, it is. That. Yeah, I fully believe that. But I certainly think it's true that um, the fact that he suffered in his body makes him, everyone can relate to that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And what was, it was something else. Oh, and I love the the stuff about the importance of preserving the spiritual life over the over physical life. I don't know. I don't think that was in these lectures, but I think that that the spirits really work on preserving spirits and God work on preserving the spiritual life more and physical life can be sacrificed in the in that hierarchy that made a lot of sense to me and there's there's something here in this lecture too about what is the one okay just left um it's spiritual death is to give yourself over to the forces of darkness and I tend to be a person who drifts and I'm trying to be more willful because it, it gets me further than just drifting and taking the path of least resistance. Yes. This is Marion, may I speak? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much for your sharing. And uh, it brings to mind and it's something you said, Alan, I don't remember exactly what, but what the guide has given us is such a gift. And that is what I call the roadmap. That's the conceptual. And the guide differentiates that between intellectual. It's the roadmap. The roadmap, the map's not the territory, but to have the roadmap. And one very important aspect on that roadmap is the um, spheres of consciousness that the guide writes about and speaks about. The individualized self one being the psychological sphere. You know, you're born, you die, it's psychology 101. It's the one of feeling like a victim, life happens to you, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's the universal uh, sphere, universal consciousness, uh, self, and that's the higher self, lower self, and mask. 
And that is a different sphere. So when we talk about going in and out of these different states of relationship with uh, the Christ, that it's it's different in each sphere. One is I'm feeling like a victim, so it's either it's, it's God or me. And the second one is oh me and God. I got a higher self and a lower self, and I got a mask over each one of them. And the third is universal spirit, which the guide is very clear about. There's no duality there. There's no creation there. There's nothing. There is not any of this that's in the dualistic sphere. So when you're in the unitive state, there's no saying I am God. It's when coming back into the dualistic sphere, after I've been in that unitive state and I come back into the third dimensional sphere, then I might say, oh, I am God. I am God in human form. And this is the shift that's happening on the planet now, shifting into um, you know, the spirit having the human experience rather than trying to improve ourselves and attain spirituality. So the guide is very clear on this when it's looked for, and it's there in the lectures. So I think that's very important for me to have some daily, you know, like the daily review, you know, that is taking all the negative stuff and keeping track of it for a week. But it can also be a review of just looking at those and what's negative without judgment and doing the daily review. So every all the tools are there in the lecture as we go in and out of these three spheres of consciousness. And the reflection will be learning about what are the characteristics of those spheres of consciousness. So when we go in and out of them, we can have some grounding in our kind of our conceptual knowing, because the guide said what makes us feel safe with our emotions is to be grounded in the conceptual. That will really get us grounded. So thank you. I find that just so, um, just a, a wonderful grounding. Thank you so much. Alan, uh, Stephen here. A question. Uh, as I, there, there were two lectures for tonight. One involved decision, making decisions. Will we I, be discussing that as well? Yeah. Why don't we talk about that? Okay. Um, yeah. Decisions and tests. Lecture number two. Hey, Tracy. Are you there? Hold Tracy, on. Tracy. Um, you are a decision maker par excellence. So can you comment on how you make decisions? Okay. I'm sorry. Every time I try to unmute, it takes me forever for some reason. But I, I keep it on mute because uh, there's a lot of, can be a lot of background noise here with the, with the dog, <laughs> with Ellie, which many of you know from, from the apartment. Um, how do I make decisions? Well, see, this would be, I, I make decisions with with my gut, which is my which is my God self. I didn't really understand that they were the same thing until much later in my life. When when I was a little girl, I had a strong gut, and I would make decisions with it instead of with my mind. And as I got as I got older, and even with with, with you know practicing law and dealing with you know very large exposures to, 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 to Pfizer, which is the company that I worked for for 30 years, I would make, you know, very large financial decisions using my gut. But now I have come to understand through my work with the path work that my gut is just my God self. It's my higher self or my divine self. What, there's a lot of words that people use, but that part of me that kind of, it knows the right thing to do it it knows the truth it's very clear and it's for me it's a it's a physical sensation which i think i just mentioned this the last time we met that i can feel it i can feel it's not just some it's not just it's not amorphic it's 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 a feel it's a very tangible feeling and it, it and i it feels like an animal inside of me when I'm doing something that my gut doesn't think is the right thing to do, trying to kind of get out. It's, it's, it's quite distinct and I recognize it now very easily. Whereas when I was younger, it was more a feeling where, whereas now it's, 
it's quite physical as well as a feeling but I, it's it's my god self I didn't, I didn't really, I thought it was intuition. I guess it is intuition, but it's, it's really my higher self, which is leading me to, to the truth and always to the, to the truth and to the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, I mean, it's sort it's my feeling is that the lecture says that like in, in page two, he says, um, you have to get acquainted with yourself, attend to yourself, examine yourself, and acquire the discipline to overcome the resistance, which is so difficult in the beginning. You have to observe all your notions about yourself, which flatter you, and with which it is so easy to deceive yourself. And then you have to cast them off and revise them. So what I get from that is that you try to tunnel into your lower self, what your negative motivations are, and then you ask for the truth in terms of making a decision well yeah that would be taking yes go going full circle i remember at the beginning of my path work years i read a lecture which said gave me one line to say which is i i want to know the truth about myself i don't remember which lecture it's in and i for years i mean i mean several years i would go around saying that you know to myself sometimes I would say it out loud but over I, mean, I probably said it a hundred thousand times in those first early years and then I was shown the truth about myself and it was a rough two years I, I remember telling Joel that it was I felt like I was like on a dagger half the time because unfortunately there was a lot of ugliness inside of me that I had ev evaded up until that point where I was uh, wanted to see it, but w w what? Yeah, what you're saying is that I mean, your 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 lower self or your ego can be very um, tricky, and it can make you, make you think you're doing the right thing when really you're not. And, but you're, and you're you're talking about a continuous commitment to the truth, right? Yes. Tracy. Yes. You know, it's interesting that. You know, Socrates, um, you know, he had this inner voice that would always tell him when he shouldn't do something. Mm -hmm. And if he didn't hear it, he would go ahead and do it. Yeah, that's interesting. And when they well, gave him, you know, the poison, he, the voice didn't say, no, this is bad, don't drink this. The voice was silent. Huh. So Socrates went ahead and drank the hemlock. And of course, you know, he had many reasons for doing that. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, it seems to me that Socrates, of course, his whole thing was the unexamined life was not worth living, right? right? So as long as you're examining yourself, in other words, as long as you're making that commitment to the truth, then perhaps you have an intuition, which in his case would be activated when he was going to do something that he shouldn't do. That's interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can always feel it if I'm... if. And at this point, it would be, it would be a, it would be mostly an unkind thought, or um, a judgmental thought, something like that. I, it, it's, it's been, I don't, I don't do, you know, hateful things or mean that, but I, I can have very hateful thoughts, and um, judgmental thoughts. So that's, so it's much more. I mean, if you if you hit somebody over the head with a baseball bat, that's pretty obvious. But when you're thinking something, and it's and you know it's there, it can be very subtle because it's not even necessarily evidencing itself by the act of desire to like hit somebody, or what or hurt them, but just like where you where you hope that they don't get some, that they're not happy, or you or you're happy when you find out that they've fallen on their on some bad luck or something like that. So you don't. You know, you're holding a grudge and you, you know, you, you, you so it can be very subtle, but the, but the lower self can also, you know, can be quite, quite tricky and, and, and like you go, oh, well, I have to tell them, you know, that they were, you know, this, that, or, you know, because somebody has, you know, they have to learn that they can't do whatever, all this, stuff. but it's really just a disguised form of being negative. It's not loving. And so, but you, you can feel it. You always can feel it. 
Does that help, Stephen, in terms of decision making? What do you think? It does. The reason why I brought it up originally was because I, I find when I try to make a decision, like I was in Florida and, uh, and should I go back to New York or not? I'm in New York now. But, um, and I would be in my mind, and my mind is, keeps ruminating and obsessing about it, and it's very sticky. It doesn't let me leave it. It keeps bringing me back saying, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. And I've come to realize that it can't figure it out. There are too many variables. Uh, and the mind insists it knows how to do it. It was only when I finally just put the mind aside and it took a certain amount of courage because that's not the way I was brought up and dropped down more into my gut and my intuition. And I just said, I'll live in the moment and the decision will essentially make itself. And I, I essentially said, I let go and, and give it to you, God. And the decision was made and it worked out okay. But I find that my mind gets very conflicted and it almost enjoys the back and forth and keeping me hostage. Yeah, sure. Well, that sounds like an image to me. You know, it sounds like some kind of a conflict that you're enmeshed in and you can't give it up. Sounds like a, a pathetic image of some something that happened maybe in your childhood. And it's just trying to make the decision. And, and I think it's um, impossible. It doesn't know. There's just, too, I guess I said too many variables. So uh, the, yeah. this whole concept of how to make a decision, I like what Tracy said, just dropping down. And that was never my uh, MO dropping down into my gut. It was always in my head. My head will figure it out. And uh, if it doesn't, then I get very frightened. This is Mary, and thank you, Stephen, because I feel you're a perfect example of what the guide has brought out about decision making. And that is, yeah, you're going to, about some things, you're going to go back and forth and in your head and childhood images and all that stuff. And after doing all that, I'll never forget that the guide said something like, and then just make the decision. And, and you're talking about that and learn from the decision rather than if it wasn't quite the way you wanted it to turn out, rather than beating up on the self, learn from the decision. So at some point, and I thought you expressed it so succinctly about all your back and forth and struggle with that, but eventually you just made the decision and that was fine. So it kind of makes me smile that it's exactly what the guide was speaking about. Just eventually make the decision. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Could I, could I? Yeah, please. <laughs> Unmute yourself, old boy. Sorry. Uh, so the guide says that the we, we have the higher self and the higher self is uh, uh, very much the, the God self, right? That's manifest in individuated form within us. And, um, and, and you, you know, in Christianity, Jesus said that um, I, I give you the Holy Spirit and that, that that's, you know, an aspect of myself and, that, and the Holy Spirit lives within you. And so that to me, I define that as uh, love and self-love that we experience and, and also truth, right? So that when we make the right decision, uh, that's an expression of an honoring of the truth, right? And, and hopefully that decisions are made in the spirit of love um, and consideration for others. So I believe that, so, so it starts with the belief that all truth, all truth exists within us all the time. And so we separate it from it, right? By our, our ego, our guilt, our mistakes, our, our human limitations. And so if we ask to, to that truth within, please tell me what to do. Show me, show me what to do, right? Where is heaven, right? Where is heaven? Heaven's right here, right? It's all around us, the perfection, right? It's not some other place. It's right here. 
and where we we we're told that we have in different traditions we have spirit guides we have angels that are with us all the time the path work talks about the angels that are assigned to us that are helping us um so we we so they're giving us signs and they're all around it might be that you hear a bird in the morning when you walk outside it's a beautiful morning and you hear a bird and you say oh my god uh God's reminding me in my in my suffering, my sadness, that that He's here, he, that He's always present, right? Or some a stranger just showing you, opening the door for you when you when you've got a bunch of, of, of bundles of bags. So it's it's remembering that the presence of God is always with us, always around us, and to look for the signs. And when I look for the signs. Um, the guidance is there, you know, our ancestors, right? Our loved ones that are on the other side. Where where are they? You know, I, I feel like they're 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 close. They're they're very close if we we open to to these possibilities. It's yeah. also well, go ahead. That's what I was saying about messages, the signs, picking up the signs. Yes. It's so important. It's also helpful to write, to write down guidance. I really find that if I have a conundrum and I write what is the truth and I state the situation, I get it. I really get the answer there. It's, it's kind of scary that it actually works like that. But that's really infallible in my experience if you concisely state a problem and then you say what is the truth please give me please guide me as to what is the truth of the situation and then you just kind of write what comes it's really scary actually it's automatic writing you get it mm. yeah very powerful well my friends are we complete, as they say? I have a question. Yes. This is just um, kind of off the subject, but this is the last lecture that was given. Is it the last one that was recorded, or is it the last one that was actually given? What happened after that? I don't know if you want to go into that tonight, but I was just curious. Well, um, this was the last lecture. I, you know, to tell you the truth, I, I don't remember if this lecture was given in front of an audience or not. And I don't remember how sick Eva was, because this was January 10th, 1979, and she died, I think, in March of 79. And um, I guess, Darlene, I'll just have to try to get more information about that for you, because I, I mean, I don't know if this was the last time the guide manifested through her. What do you think, Marion? Do you remember? Well, you know how memory is, you know. Uh, I wouldn't go by. I thought it was transmitted to Eva because it wasn't long after her cancer return that she did pass on. But I would not go by my memory. <laughs> that was just well, no, kind it was of what certainly, I've always told Certainly me. transmitted through Eva. I'm just wondering whether it was... You know, in a lecture. So I thought it was public. I thought I thought we were all there, but I don't go by that. Yeah, do your re you're a very good researcher, Alan. So you can probably yeah. find out more about that. Yeah. I'll ask around too. Yeah. I really like the fact that there's no sense of the guide saying goodbye. Mm -hmm. In this lecture. No. It's yeah. like the whole yeah. thing is cyclical. One lecture, there's no end really to these uh, yeah. lectures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. But I have to say goodbye. I have to leave now. Okay. All right, take it easy, Thanks, Nancy. Everyone. It was wonderful. Okay, Stay everybody. Safe. Take care. Yes, thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so we'll, uh, shall we do a brief meditation? Hey, Nancy, even though you're leaving, you can still meditate. Um, I guess you took off. So let's yeah, you're a, with us. Let's have a 10 minute meditation about, I guess I want to thank God for, our, for, for the presence of all of us together, all of you friends. 
And I don't know if you're a stand-in for God or you're the same thing as God or you're a stand-in for Christ, but it's a good feeling to support each other. All right. Ten minutes. <laughs>